All right, everybody, welcome to this event, which is part of Outbreak Week, which is spearheaded by the Harvard Global Health Institute. Today, we are exploring vaccines for outbreaks in the modern world. My name is Carmel Shahar, and I'm the executive director of the Petrie Flom Center for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology, and Bioethics at Harvard Law School. We have the pleasure of co-sponsoring this event, along with the Harvard Global Health Institute, as well as the Center for Communicable Disease Dynamics over at the T.H. Stan T. H. Chan School of Public Health. So I'm here to do two things. To first of all tell you that if Outbreak Week is something that you find very exciting, there's no shame in that. I too think that Outbreak Week is really fascinating. I wish that it happened more than once a year. But if you like these kind of events, please go to the Petrie Flom Center's website and sign up for our newsletter. We host a bunch of events in the healthcare, health law, biotechnology, bioethics space. So chances are, if you like Outbreak Week, you'll like some of our upcoming events, and we would love to see you there. We also have a blog, Bill of Health, that kind of explores a lot of these issues that you might find interesting. But I also want to plug this event. I think vaccines is such an important topic. I was remarking to people that yesterday at our media event, looking at the role of media and outbreaks, we kept on going back to the topic of vaccines and people kept on talking about how that was one of the more difficult topics to responsibly and appropriately cover. The other story that I want to raise is that vaccines have become such a contentious issue that two years ago, when I got a puppy and took the puppy to the vet, the vet kind of looked at me and went, how do you feel about giving your dog vaccines? And I was like, yeah, is that even an option? And the vet was like, oh my gosh, you have no idea how many of my patients fight me because they're afraid their puppy will grow up to be autistic. Now, I don't know what an autistic dog looks like. I think researchers who study autism might be very excited to find out that you can cause autism in dogs, but it really goes to show that there is an immense amount of emotion associated with vaccines, right? That people are afraid enough to even try to avoid getting their dogs vaccinated. And so a serious exploration of this topic, especially in the context of pandemics and outbreaks, is so very necessary. I won't take up too much more of your time except to introduce somebody who has been really instrumental to bringing this event to fruition as well as the rest of Outbreak Week. And that person is Ashish Jha, who is the Dean for Global Strategy and the KT Lee Professor of Global Health at the Chan School of Public Health, as well as the Director of the Harvard Global Health Institute. So join me as I welcome him to the stage. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, um, we are gonna talk about vaccines. And vaccines are incredibly complicated. Um, they are also arguably the greatest public health intervention that we've had, I mean, along with sanitation and uh, clean air, um, I would argue, uh, vaccines are one of the very few things that saves lives, saves money, uh, is really an incredible advancement. Um, this is outbreak week, so we sort of think about vaccines classically as a preventive thing, but we have been learning that vaccines are incredibly important in the middle of outbreaks. We think it had a really important role in the last outbreak in the, in the DRC. It's been playing a very important role in this one. Um, but vaccines are complicated. They're complicated in their science. Uh, they're complicated in how people accept them or don't or have confidence in them and, and interact with them. Um, there's a lot of complexity around both the science and the so sociology and the psychology of vaccines. Um, and we're gonna try to explore some of those issues today. But as we get started, let me very quickly introduce um, a gentleman who really uh, has been extraordinarily engaged at the, at the forefront and at the, in the leadership of thinking about uh, preparedness, response, et cetera, and that's Mike Ryan. He's the Assistant Director General uh, for Emergency Preparedness and Response at the World Health Organization. Um, and he's been at the forefront of managing acute crises for 20 years. Um, involved in acute illnesses, he's been involved in 12 Ebola outbreaks in one form or another. Uh, was part of UNMIR, for those of you who know UNMIR, the United Nations Mission for Ebola Emergency Response in 2014-2015. Uh, and is also a professor at University College Dublin. And when Mike agreed to come, we were absolutely thrilled. We couldn't think of anybody better uh, to kick us off. So Mike, grateful for your coming. Thank you so much for being here. OK. 
first note to self, don't have someone with perfect eyesight print out your speech. <laughs> anyway, thank you, uh, Carmel and Ajish, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is indeed a great honour and pleasure for me to be here uh, at Harvard uh, to join a conversation with you on uh, vaccines uh, for outbreaks in the modern world. Uh, this is a very timely uh, and very important conversation. Uh, my name is Mike Ryan and uh, I've been spent the last 25 years uh, fighting epidemics. Um, I attended the screening of Contagion last night and in the introduction we were told that it, I think la yesterday was exactly the 100th anniversary since the authorities in Massachusetts shut down all the schools, banned all public gatherings in the face of the spread and impact of the 1918 influenza pandemic. Sort of a sobering reminder, 100 years later, of the way in which uh, epidemics not only impact health, but our social, political uh, and economic stability, um, uh, even today. Um, I'm noted for having a terrible memory. Well, a terribly selective memory. Uh, I've always rationalised this by uh, thinking there must be some evolutionary advantage to short memories. Uh, the value of putting awful events behind us so we can move on as individuals and communities. And we all have personal experience of that. There's one huge disadvantage to this behaviour. We forget the pain, the suffering and the loss. And we, as Jim Kim and the World Bank has put it, speaking of epidemics, often move from panic to neglect. Saying best to put things behind us and move on might have saved a lot of political skins in the past, but maybe not so much anymore. <laughs> Remembering the 1918 pandemic and, and other epidemics, uh, it's important to remember those who were lost, the brave health workers who stood in the front line. Uh, it's essential to remember them. But if we examine these events, we can learn the lessons and be better prepared for the next one. As WHO's Director General, Dr. Tedra says, our job is to keep the world safe. However, there's where another human frailty kicks in beyond memory loss. It's the, uh, I know what I should do, but I never do it syndrome. How many times in our own lives do we look back on a personal disaster, knowing that we knew it could happen, we knew that we could have done something about it, but we just didn't. And yet again, as a society, we suffer the same issue. We face future shocks, sometimes knowing we could do something to avert them, but we don't seem to be able to summon the collective energy and resolve to change that future. Uh, that's where I think we are with epidemics and pandemics. We know we have a problem. It scares us. But we have not as yet put together a coherent set of actions that would avert such a disaster. Uh, yes. Uh, to use the American vernacular, we do stuff. We train epidemiologists, nurses, physicians. We make small-scale investments in drugs and vaccine development. And interestingly, we've developed a small army of shroud waivers who regularly scare us to death, be it in the media or in the public eye. But in reality, our efforts are often piecemeal. They're undergeared and suffer a fairly shocking lack of ambition and resolve. In saying that, I have profound admiration for all of those in many sectors, public and private, who continue to try to get us ready for the next pandemic, for those in the front lines of epidemic response as I speak, and for those policymakers who are trying to make us move forward towards a safer world for all our children. Today as I speak, hundreds of brave health workers risk infection and physical attack in DR Congo, fighting Ebola. Others toll against cholera in Zimbabwe and Niger and other countries. They are doing so armed with no more than their commitment and hope. But they do have vaccines. In Pakistan and Afghanistan, hundreds of thousands of health workers are tracking polio viruses and vaccinating millions of children in an effort to eradicate this horrific disease. All around the world, children have been vaccinated against killer diseases like measles and diphtheria. In fact, Vaccination has been the single most, as Shaji uh, said, uh, the single most effective health intervention ever developed and delivered. Interestingly, the other great health protectors have been water, sanitation, improved housing, 
better nutrition, uh, none of which have been delivered by the health sector per se. Millions of lives have been protected and saved by vaccination over the years, and we should take a moment to remember those uh, pioneers who have given us those gifts. However, I think we should also be concerned. While we have the wonderful tool of vaccination, all is not well. Uh, so my shroud braving moment has now arrived. Uh, we continue to see vaccines underutilized uh, due to failing, weak and inequitable healthcare delivery systems around the world, as well as the mistrust of those life-saving interventions is growing, in many places uh, due to misinformation. In the last couple of years, we've seen major outbreaks of measles and diphtheria, despite the availability of cheap and high-quality vaccines. We have seen polio eradication threatened, and the uptake of new vaccines like HPV fall well short of their uh, expectations. Before I come on to talk about what new vaccines we need and are developing for outbreaks, I must stop here and say we must use the vaccines we already have in a more effective way. And again, we are back to human frailties. The, the I want the new thing, not the thing I already have syndrome. Let's look at a few examples. Firstly, let's look at yellow fever or yellow jacket, as it was called in the Americas. Um, a devastating disease that has been a scourge of humanity for centuries. We have a cheap, safe and effective vaccine which is in the EPI protocol for at-risk countries. Yet vaccination rates remain terribly low in many places with the constant threat of epidemics. WHO and its partners have maintained a strategic stockpile of yellow fever vaccine for many years, supplying countries facing yellow fever epidemics. But this isn't a long-term solution. Routine population-based vaccination is the answer to avert what yellow fever outbreaks in the modern world. Our ending yellow fever epidemics, or I strategy, calls for this ramp up in routine immunization, in addition to large scale catch up campaigns and maintaining global strategic stockpiles, etc. But getting support for this vital strategy has proved exceptionally challenging. In addition, WHO works with its ICG partners to maintain strategic stockpiles of meningitis, cholera, and smallpox vaccine, and has sophisticated mechanisms to distribute them on the basis of epidemiologic lead. Let's take a quick look at cholera, where I can explore another of the aforementioned human frailties, the magic bullet syndrome, when it comes to vaccines. Rarely are vaccines effectively purely in their own right. Take cholera, a disease for which we have a good vaccine. Yes, it's a good vaccine, but only really useful when used in conjunction with other measures like the provision of water and sanitation. The cholera vaccine can protect populations in the short term while we improve water and sanitation, but we never seem to get around to the water and sanitation bit. So we're often left to repeatedly use vaccination as a short term, last line of defense. It's heroic stuff, it's great for a movie script, but wasteful and misguided and predicated on our passion for magic bullets. We need to recognize that vaccination in the face of epidemics must be seen as one of a coordinated series of interventions that collectively protect, preserve and restore health. So, as we look to our future and the risks that may hold for high impact epidemics and pandemics, we all see that once again vaccines present a major opportunity for us to stop these things on their tracks, prevent their spread, protect the health of individuals, preserve our societal cohesion, economic pr prosperity and political stability. All laudable goals, but not deliverable without a step change in the way we look at the problem and invest in the solutions. We are, however, making progress. And now at last, to the strengths of the human condition, ingenuity, passion, resolve and solidarity, the other side of the human frailty equation. Despite the challenges, we have and are exploring the biotechnology and communications revolutions to develop new and more effective countermeasures for epidemics. Our ability to predict and detect epidemics is getting better. New diagnostic tools are giving us more rapid ways to confirm <clears throat> disease, even at the bedside. And we are at last investing in new and faster vaccine technologies for many epidemic diseases, not least of which is influenza. We have the capacity to rapidly develop candidate vaccines for influenza, but we still struggle with the timelines for producing enough of them quickly and quickly enough and distributing them equitably enough to make a difference. Right now, even in the best case scenario, 
It will take us six months to go into full production of a pandemic vaccine. Way too long for a virus that will probably have circled the world at least once in that time and killed hundreds of thousands. Beyond this problem is the ethical problem. Who gets the vaccine? Those most in need, those most at risk, or those who can pay. We need to shorten the timescales and come up with ways to distribute vaccine equitably. This is happening on both fronts. We see tentative investments in universal influenza vaccine, which is very welcome, but this will take years, if not decades, to deliver. In the meantime, there are other things we can do using things like, and there are many more experts in the room than me, using things like nucleic acid vaccines, where production could be begin simply after distributing a required genetic sequence. Only problem is we don't have the manufacturing platforms as yet that we could switch production to. So the problem is not the technology, the problem is the platform. Beyond influenza, there's a number of other high threat pathogens with pandemic potential. They have been carefully prioritized through WHO's R&D blueprint, working with partners in the global coordination mechanism in order to accelerate the development of vaccines. We've seen the creation of the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness uh, Interventions uh, that makes targeted investments with the private sector for the development of specific vaccines from our priority list of pathogens. Vaccines are under development or being tested for a number of pathogens, including Ebola, Marburg, MERS, SARS, Nipah, and Zika viruses. This is a new departure as many of these were orphan diseases only a few years ago, with limited interest in the development of vaccines. In some cases, the target vaccination may end up being the animals who transmit the virus to humans and not the humans themselves. Another interesting option for us as we go forward for outbreaks. After I finish, I think Lydia, Mark and John, sounds like a, a title of a song, <laughs> will speak to Ebola vaccines. Uh, we're seeing major steps forward in candidate vaccines as we speak, with more than 11,000 people being vaccinated in the most recent and still ongoing epidemic of Ebola in DR Congo, using EBOV, under an investigational use protocol with a ring vaccination strategy. You cannot imagine how difficult that is to do in the middle of a shooting war to bring vaccine to the field at minus 80 degrees, to do informed consent with every single person, to identify every contact, every contact of a contact, reach every village and vaccinate everybody. In, for, um, for suitable candidates or for eligible candidates, our vaccine coverage is over 99%, which is an incredible effort on behalf of mainly the health workers of Congo and those who support them, uh, vaccine specialists from, uh, from Guinea. Um, but none of that works in this difficult environment unless we know what the virus is. Again, the need for good surveillance and excellent mobile labs. Even with this in hand, we need a community that accepts the vaccination and not the associated misinformation. Unfortunately, our efforts in Congo right now are struggling because a community that's beginning to mistrust has years of mistrust, of massacres, of war, of lack of delivery of basic services. Uh, and our vaccine has become wrapped up in this political argument and currently our whole operation is at risk because of de deteriorating insecurity. We'd like to thank all our partners, including Merck's, the NIH and the FDA here in the USA who have worked so closely with us and with the Ministries of Health and all partners in the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network on the ground uh, to make this whole process happen. I'm sure there's much more to come in this space as we develop new vaccines, drugs and diagnostics, better communication strategies for community involvement and engagement. In conclusion, I think human ingenuity, human passion, commitment and solidarity can outweigh our human frailties and shortcomings. We have the combined capacity to prepare for, predict, prevent and mitigate the impact of the next big epidemic or pandemic. It's not a choice, but an imperative. We must succeed and we must mobilize every part of our society to do so. The public, academic and private sectors are coming together and we must stick together to see this through. Our political leaders must recognize the risks and invest heavily in the solutions over a sustained time period. We're in Massachusetts and as a proud Irishman who's proud of a proud Irish American, I can say appropriately in his beloved Massachusetts, I can recall the words of JFK. And he said, we choose to go to the moon in this decade, 
and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one we are willing to accept and one we are unwilling to postpone. And one we intend to win and the others too. It's my fervent hope that when, the, when he said the other things, we might honor his tremendous vision and legacy and deliver another form of moonshot vaccines for outbreaks in the modern world. Thank you. Mike, you mind staying up for about five minutes for questions? Would that sure. be okay? Um, and what, so well, let's take five minutes for questions and comments. That was terrific and really um, helpful. And I'm gonna ask the first one while people wanna come up to uh, ask questions here, which is, so since 2014, 15 with the Ebola outbreak, feels like there's renewed energy. There's CEPI, there's the roadmap. Mm -hmm. um, how optimistic are you that we're on our way towards that moonshot of making real progress on, on things? Or, or are you worried that we're going to just fall short because often the energy runs out before the, uh, before the day is finished? So uh, how, how are you feeling about that? And then again, people, people want to ask questions like mm -hmm. two or three. Just come on up to the well, Dr. Tom Grine, our head of acute operations, was currently arriving in Congo. He's German and a pragmatist. He regularly accuses me of being a pathological optimist. <laughs> so anything I say <laughs> needs to be taken in the light of people's view of me. No, I, I'm eternally optimistic. I, 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 I just think we have the pieces, but we haven't got the scale. And I think things like the R&D blueprint, things like CEPI take us to another level. I think it brings together the public and the private sector. I see Ryan Moorhart over there from the World Economic Forum. We're doing work now with the public, the private sector, everything from liability management to regulatory pathways. It's, about, it's, it's a bit like the Manhattan Project. Each piece is so important. Uh, it's, like the, it's like the International Space Station. It doesn't work unless everything works in, in a way. So yes, hopeful. But uh, I, I shudder and I sometimes get scared at the scale, especially if we talk. I think we'll get there with the Ebola vaccines. We'll get there with the MERS vaccines. My biggest fear, to be quite frank with you, is pandemic influenza uh, and whether we actually get there in time. We don't, have the, we don't have the speed and the agility and the scale to deal with the truly serious pandemic of influenza again. I, I don't believe we do. Questions, questions for Mike? I'll ask one more, and we'll, we'll stop there since nobody else seems to be jumping. Just by the way, that's yeah. the global emergencies map as of 2 o'clock this afternoon. So you'll see, uh, as one regional director said to me recently, my region is on fire. I think you can guess which region. So, oh, actually. You can ask your Mary, No, no, please. please. Hi, Marion Wentworth. Um, uh, you, uh, you teased me with a couple of uh, things that you dropped in your last answer. Um, and two things of, are of interest to me, and I can take just one answer instead of two. Um, one is, where have we gotten in terms of thinking about new kinds of manufacturing platforms? There are so many different diseases that can cause outbreaks. The whole notion that we can get exactly right an X liter mm -hmm. you know, facility that can do mm -hmm. this, that, and the other is just... The world can't afford that much infrastructure, and nobody's going to do it anyway. Um, and the other is the regulatory mechanism, which if you want to leave that for the panel to answer, I can ask mm -hmm. it again. Um, but honestly, we still have an unapproved Ebola vaccine, even though we're in our third outbreak. What does that mean? Yeah, I can answer part of the second part <laughs> first. The second one, if you yeah, the, uh, <laughs> the fact that we have an investigation and use vaccine is a credit to, to everyone involved. And, uh, I can't tell you the amount of work that's going on between ourselves, Merck's, FDA, EMEA, trying to push this thing through. But we have a duty of care with any new product, and we have to. And this is part of the process. Can we shorten those periods, get them right down to the absolute minimum? Um, that I, I think we're almost reaching a point where it's almost impossible to chop any more chunks out of the process unless you throw some of the process overboard, and that's always needs to be carefully considered. Uh, given the, the problems we've had in the past with uh, unsafe vaccines. So we have to be very, very careful in that regard. In terms of platforms, I agree. There's a myriad of different platforms out there, different ways of approaching vaccine production. 
I think our biggest issue is that scale up. We're all producing vaccines, and some people are producing tissue culture vaccines, nucleic acid vaccines, eggs grow, vaccines grown in eggs, and everything. Everyone's on a slightly different sort of pathway. Uh, and in the end, we can't turn all of that production capacity into the, into the production of a pandemic vaccine in, in, in real time. Uh, we can move from injectable vaccines to, to live attenuated vaccines. There are lots of other different pathways to get mass vaccination more quickly with vaccines that may have more acceptable uh, uh, safety profiles. Uh, but I, I, the real challenge is, how, how do you shorten everything without cutting corners? How do you get from A to B without, you know, without going through C, D, and God knows how many other waypoints? And how do you stay safe in doing that? Um, and uh, there is no answer. I think the only answer is we have to find better ways. And I'm not the expert in that, and certainly WHO within our we, we represent 194 member states, but we're not the innovators. The innovators are out there in industry. The innovators are out there in academia. All we can do is provide a safe, transparent, coordinated space in which these conversations can happen and we can come up with new ways of doing things.